Hi guys, as you can see, I'm not in the car as I expected to be. Last week I said, hey, I'm gonna do uh, this week's weekly update from the new car, which I picked up a couple of days ago in Melbourne and uh, subsequently drove up to Sydney yesterday. I did record the weekly update in the car uh, with my travel companion, Lars Clint. Unfortunately, Lars's GoPro didn't work so well, so that was lost. Uh, so now I'm somewhere quite different, which is probably pretty self-explanatory. So I have made it to Sydney and I'm sort of doing this video uh, as a bit of a redux of the one I did yesterday and you know what, it's, it's not a bad location and it kind of complements the San Francisco bridge shot from a few weeks ago. So, you know, it's all good. Jumping into it, several uh, things of the last week that are noteworthy. So one of them is that I wrote uh, actually on Friday last week, my time, about the world's most prolific hacker. and. I had this, this stock photo, which is the normal sort of, you know, hoodie, dark scenes, uh, binary. Hackers really like binary, by the way. All this sort of stuff in the stock photo. And this same photo is used across just a huge array of different security incidents. And the one that sort of brought it to my attention was one of the Yahoo incidents where they're going, hey, you know, here's, here's the hacker behind Yahoo. Uh, and of course, it's just an illustration, but I guess the point is, is that this same imagery is used over and over and over again and it's kind of interesting to think about why they're doing this why do we see the same photo and look part of this is a little bit of journalistic I guess illustration for want of a better term but it's a deliberately sort of scary picture and it's used on many of these different security incidents uh, in order to create a little bit of sensationalism a little bit of fear I have used before in some of my talks uh, some examples of some of this imagery uh, and how it gets used, and it is a bit windy here as well, how it gets used in order to try and create this fear. Uh, so in fact I show how there's often sort of dark and scary videos, uh, often with some scary music overlaid as well to try and give a sense of what hackers are trying to do. Now this is used by a combination of media companies in order to try and uh, I guess create a little bit of excitement about their story also used by security companies in order to try and get people to buy more of their security stuff. So, uh, that is, uh, you know, look, it's a kind of tongue-in-cheek, kind of fun post, but I think, again, there's a little bit more symbolism behind it than what immediately meets the eye as well. That was that one. Now, there's another interesting thing that happened, and I want to sort of talk about this. It's not something I wrote about at the time, but I think it's just an important kind of uh, privacy issue in terms of the way I run Have I Been Pwned and the way I make data available. What happened last week is I had a journalist contact me, journalist in the UK, and the journalist said, uh, I would like to try and get some data on an individual. And he had the individual's email address. And it was the individual behind the London terrorist attack recently, the one where he drove the car into the people on, uh, uh, on Westminster Bridge. And this journalist was saying, I've searched Have I Been Pwned for this guy's email address. I've found him in one or more incidents. Can you please give me his data? And basically the journalist is saying, can you go and pull things like, you know, address, phone number, whatever else it was in the data breach and send it to him. And I'm going, mate, what you're actually asking for is you're asking me to go and pull someone's personal data out of one of these incidents and send it to you. And Basically, I, I had a, a bit of an ethical issue in terms of I don't think I should be giving that data to any party, uh, almost any party, the exception being the likes of law enforcement. In fact, I said to him, look, if it was law enforcement who came along and said, we would like to get this data because it may actually help us stop other really nasty stuff from happening or figure out why the guy did what he did, great, that's a very good reason. Anyway, this journalist got quite irate. And I've got a little quote here, and he DM'd this to me, so I'm not going to actually name who it is. But I want to just try and illustrate some of the thinking and explain why I treat this data as I do. So he said here, it's investigative journalism, not some quick fix. But if you're going to obstruct me, then I suggest you get in touch with the police. Let me rephrase that. I'm trying to read this in the sunlight. <laughs> I suggest you do get in contact with the police with that information. Now, first of all, the reason he said police is I had said to him earlier on, look, I would provide this to law enforcement, as I just mentioned. It is nothing that would be of much use to law enforcement because it's stuff they'd have already, addresses, phone numbers, stuff like that. But what really, frankly, pissed me off about this is the guy is saying, I'm obstructing him. 
but you know, in, in a way, yes, and I should be too. I'm going to abstract anyone who wants to try and leverage me to get private data about someone else. And I, I think one of the things here that, as I reflected on it for a bit, and I did give it a lot of thought as well, never in terms of should I give him or should I not give him the data, but rather what, what is it in my mind that made me make that decision. I don't want to be the one making judgment calls on whether or not the ethics of what someone has done warrants me providing their personal information to a journalist or just about anyone else. And really, look, I mean, whether they're a terrorist or any other sorts of other nasty things, it's not for me to make the call on how I should redistribute their personal data. And I'm particularly not going to give, I'm not going to give it to anyone, but I'm particularly not going to give it to someone who then just wants to go out and write stories really for their own benefit. And let's face it, this is not something that is in the public interest. It really doesn't matter too much to the general public what this guy's personal data was. What should be more important is the fact there's going to be a legal process that goes, goes uh, uh, that happens now, and they try and figure out what the hell went on. So the reason why I wanted to tell that story is that the personal data that I hold as part of these data breaches is enormously sensitive and I treat it with a great deal of respect. The only examples that I can honestly think of where I've provided that data to anyone is the companies themselves who've been breached. Uh, so recently there was a case where I loaded about 140 different breaches from vBulletin sites into Have I Been Pwned. Now this was in the news, the sites were named, one of the sites in that list reached out to me, one of the owners of the site reached out to me and said, hey, look, you know, we want to figure out what's going on. Could you send us the data? Now, I went through a verification process. I established that this was someone that owns the site, and then I sent them the data, and that is perfectly reasonable. But that is a far cry from some random person popping up, asking for the data, and then getting cranky when I don't give it to them. So, as for this bloke, uh, hopefully he's, he's had a bit of time to think about, uh, about the way he came across there and maybe won't do it again, but this is UK tabloid media as well, so he probably will. Moving on, something a little bit different. The Apple data. Now this Apple data story has been in the news probably for about the last week, week and a bit, and the story is, is that there's this group, individual, who knows, it's all anonymous stuff as usual, popped up and said, uh, we have hundreds of millions of iCloud accounts, iCloud accounts, Apple accounts, whatever. Uh, we are going to erase these people's data and remote wipe their devices. Now, this is uh, an organization or a set of individuals going under the name of the Turkish crime family. Now, I don't know if they're Turkish, I don't know if they're a family. The criminal bit though, we can be pretty sure about because this does sort of boil down to extortion. Because they're saying, hey Apple, give us 70 grand and there are different stories about how much they actually want or is it 70 grand per person of the Turkish crime family I don't know give us money or we're gonna delete the data now of course Apple's never gonna give them any money you know like this is just never gonna happen which then sort of leads us to the point of okay well are we going to get to their deadline and they've set a deadline I think it was around the 7th of April so are we gonna get about a week from today and actually see accounts erased and this is where things start to get a little bit interesting because now we get to talk about, okay, do they actually have this data and are they going to be able to do nasty things with it? They sent a sample of the data to a ZDNet journalist uh, named Zach Whitaker. And I've worked with Zach a number of times on various data breach stories. Zach does a great job of researching this information, really digging into it, getting his facts straight. Uh, and as part of that, he wanted to verify with me if the sample of data they gave him was, not only was it legit, but could I possibly figure out where it had come from? So he gave me this data, and I don't have all the figures in front of me. I am writing a blog post about this where I'll explain it in more detail. But Zach put a little bit of info on a ZDNet update, so I want to share some info here. But it was something like around about 65,000 odd records were given to him. That actually distilled down to something like 50,000 unique email addresses. And then some email addresses had multiple different passwords against them. And I took this data and I plugged it into Have I Been Pwned. So I, I basically just went through and said, okay, for every one of these accounts, have they appeared in any data breaches? And almost every single one had. Depending on how I sliced the data, it was either like 98% or 99 point something percent. All right, so a massive amount. So the first thing that said to me is, these guys have probably got this data from other data breaches. The next thing I looked at is, 
which data breaches were they in? And there was a really, really heavy predominance of Evany accounts. So Evany is this gaming site. I loaded it in a week and a half, two weeks ago. And it was something like 80% of the accounts that were in Have I Been Pwned matched with Evany. And then what I've been doing is I've been going through trying to figure out, okay, well, did this come from Ebony? Did it come from other places? And this will be in the blog post, which I've been drafting up and is almost ready to go. I've just had the travel thing the last few days. I haven't been able to do it. And what I've actually found is that a huge amount of it came from Ebony, not just the email addresses, but the passwords that they have in the Apple data is the same as Ebony. The data came out about the same time as the Ebony data breach started circulating. So you see how all the dots are joining up here. And of the remaining accounts that weren't in the Ebony breach, you could boil them down to mostly last FM and a couple of other ones. Long story short, basically all the data has come out of data which is already circulating. Now I also don't think that they were necessarily trying to say they had breached Apple. And part of the problem with this story is that depending on which one of the individuals in this group is talking, you get sort of different stories. But I think it's a reasonable enough assumption to say, look, they're not trying to say they've breached Apple, but rather they have Apple credentials. One of the things I was interested in is, okay, they've given Zach 65 odd thousand accounts. If they say that they've got 200 million, can we draw any conclusions about whether that 200 million, and again, different stories or rather different people seem to represent different total numbers, can we draw any conclusions about whether that 200 million number is legit? Now, what, what I reckon, and this will be in the piece that I'm writing up, is that basically the data that they've provided as a sample is probably pretty much everything they have. And the, the reason why is that if I go through the Ebony breach and I look for all of the different Apple accounts, they're basically all in the sample. So it's not like there's been Ebony and all this other data as well and they've taken a random sample out of the whole lot and given that to Zach. It looks like they've just gone, let's just get all the Apple stuff we can, all the plain text passwords we can. We'll say that this is a small fraction of everything, but it looks like it is actually a, pretty much the whole kit and caboodle, like it's everything they've got. Now I'll explain why I think that more when I actually push this post out, but what it boils down to is, they almost certainly only have tens of thousands of email address password pairs. Zach's story, and I'll link to that in the notes for this video as well, says that when he reached out to people, he found that a lot of them said, yes, this password is the password I use, because we've got the password reuse problem, and I also use it on Apple. A lot of them also said, no, that is not my Apple password. So some subset of that number of tens of thousands is actually gonna have legit accounts. The data's been provided to Apple. So Apple now knows which of the username password pairs that these guys have, and of course they can take preventative measures with those Apple accounts. The chances of them actually being able to do any proper damage come the deadline are just about zero. They may be able to reset a very small fraction of the overall number of accounts due to password reuse. But that's going to be it. And really what that means is that the whole story here is not about Apple and it's not about Ebony or any of these sorts of things. It's about the fact that people reuse their passwords, a data breach happens, bad guys get the credentials out of the data breach, and then they exploit them other places. And that is the same story that we just see over and over and over again, which means that there's nothing unique about this one, other than the fact that they've seemed to manage the media pretty well and have gotten a lot of press. That's what I reckon is going on. I'm going to explain it all properly in that blog post, which will probably get out early next week now. And then when I do the weekly update uh, next week, I can talk more about the actual detail of it. So anyway, that is going to be a big non-event. Almost certainly going to be a big non-event. There's always just a little caveat there, just in case I miss something. All right, last thing, as the wind is coming up as well. Uh, this week, as with last week, I have been sponsored by Exabeam. So Exabeam has been sitting up there in the sponsor bar of my blog. So big thanks to those guys. They've uh, backed me for a fortnight there. It'll be someone else next week. And then I think as we get to about the middle of April, I've actually got space free uh, in the sponsor bar. Uh, and unless I feel that, it will actually be the first time I've had free space since I started sponsorship in, when was it, August, September? Quite a while ago. And that'll be fine if that's the case. But I'm really happy those guys are there this week and that I've been able to use this model and get rid of those lousy stinking ads that nobody really wants to see. 
So that's it for this week. This has been a really nice spot. Next week I'll be back at home on the Gold Coast. Uh, I've got to drive back uh, on the weekend after I finish doing my Microsofty things here. And we will be back to business as usual. Thanks very much for watching.